Okay, welcome back. And as you can see, we're in After Effects now. And what I've done is brought in that render that we did out of Max. And I've brought it in a couple of times, two times. The first time I brought it in, and I'll show you here on the left, if I get rid of our background. The first one I brought in, I selected pre-multiplied alpha on black. And the second one is unmatted. So it has no alpha information on it at all. And the third image that I have is the background that we used originally before we put our geometry into the scene. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just grab our RPF matted and drag it down onto the composition button. And that's going to create a new composition for us. And it doesn't matter, the length doesn't matter. We're, we're really not dealing with uh, animation or timeline stuff in this tutorial. It's really just the effect based on that RPF information. So you'll see that there's, uh, there's alpha channel there, which is taken straight from the 32 bit alpha built into the RPF. And what I can do is bring the original road JPEG down underneath. And there we have our scene looking the way it did in 3D Max. So what can we do with this? Well, first thing we can do is grab our RPF. Say we want the teapot to have a gold tinge to it. it we want instead of looking silver, um, sterling silver, we want it to look gold. So let's grab our RPF and Control D. We'll make a copy. And we're just going to isolate that and we're going to go into our effects effects panel there and we're going to right click and bring up 3d channel and we're going to we'll use id mat and we're going to at the moment you'll notice that the geometry all disappeared but the road stayed there uh, or the, the the shadows on the road stayed there and the reason for that is that the road still maintained the object ID of zero. It was the only one I left on zero, but the rest of the geometry has a separate object ID. And what we'll do is just highlight this and use the arrow key to go through. There's our torus knot on ob object ID two. There's our sphere on ID three, our square on ID or our cube on ID four our cylinder on ID 5 and there's our teapot there and we have it isolated and if I was to unhide the road there we have our um, teapot back there and what we can do is grab the teapot material might as well leave the background on uh, so I grab the teapot la layer and we'll just rename this pot and what we can do is in the effects stack give a color correction and let's give it a hue and saturation and what we'll do is colorize and we'll just slide our hue around until we get a gold color and then we'll bring up the saturation a little bring up the bring up the lightness just slightly maybe saturate it down just a bit and probably drop the Drop the darkness, saturate it. Just play with it until you get something that's reading as gold back there. And that's going to be fine. So now if we unhide our other layer, you'll see that our teapot is gold. And it's all been based on the same render, the same RPF matted render that we have down in here. And I could do the same. I could um, grab that pot layer, control D, and just go into the effects and change the ID selection number to five and you'll see it's the cylinder or four it's the box or three is it's the sphere so we'll leave it on the sphere and we'll go for maybe a reddish a red color something like that And you'll see now that the power that you have with it all built into that RPF to allow you to isolate various parts of your 3D render and change various aspects based on that material ID. Now, let's have a look at a new, um, a different feature here now. 
and just use the base matted which is this one here and what we're going to do is bring up that 3d channel depth of field and what I tend to do is go a little bit silly on the blur just to work out where the what they call the focal plane is positioned so if I wind up the maximum blur radius to 10 you'll see that everything gets blurry and the focal plane thickness just for the uh, an example I'll, sh I'll give it 200 and then I'm going to wind the focal plane down into the negative bearing in mind that Z depth in negative is further away from the camera and positive is behind the camera so zero is right where the camera is and the lower I go it starts to wind that blur further out towards the teapot now what I want to do is set the focal plane on the let's say the cube so we've got the focal plane positioned on the cube it's it's in focus but everything else is blurry and now we're just going to wind the focal plane thickness up a little bit just until we start to get that sphere half half the amount of blur about there and then we're going to wind the radius back down to something a little more practical which will go 1.5 and if we just unhide the background you'll see now and it's a little bit too blurry down the back there so let's drop that to 0.75 and obviously it doesn't meet um, probably for this example we'll, we'll make a solid instead of this background the background is is fairly crisp in in um, in focal depth blurring down to you know quite the way down the road here so it, it's not quite matching but uh, if we just create a new solid white's fine we're just going to drop that down underneath and we're just going to hide that background layer there you'll see that the effect that we're getting is quite blurry up here um, uh, definitely blurry down where the teapot is and as it moves more towards the square or the sphere uh, the cube um, it's nice and crisp and then as it comes closer to camera it gets blurry again and so what we can do is highlight that and change that to let's crank it up for the purpose of having a look and we'll just move you notice here that we can just put it on the teapot right down the back and it's a gradual blur that as you go further away um, that blurring is uh, is happening nicely down the back here so that's a very powerful feature and used quite a lot in animation um, of uh, stylized worlds of say Disney any Warner Brothers stuff um, any 3d animation it's a very powerful tool because to render that out of 3d to render that depth of field in 3d it takes a lot of time and it's almost a factor 10 and up in render time whereas you saw how easy I was able to do that in post-production um, in After Effects and how simple it is to do with very little render overhead so it's a very powerful tool now I'll show you another I'll just get rid of that depth of field or we'll leave that and we're just going to duplicate we'll grab this gold these other two pot layers and get rid of them I'm going to duplicate that channel and isolate it we're going to get rid of the depth of field so we're still just looking at our at our image there on a white background and what I can do is use a depth mat in the 3d channels we can go depth mat and immediately everything disappears but if I wind the depth in negative the torus appears the ball appear uh, the sphere appears then the cube so I'm still winding in negative there's the cylinder and there's the teapot so what I can do is actually isolate I can bring it in until I'm just looking at the cube just on the other side of the cube so that's it there and then what I can do is duplicate that in the effects stack with control D so I now have two deep depth mats there and what I can do is just slide it I'll, I'll switch the top one off I'm going to continue sliding up back towards zero until I just get rid of this the cube and then I'm going to invert it 
and then I'm going to switch the depth map back on. Now you'll see that we just have the cube. We've used depth mat to get rid of everything behind the cube and everything in front of the cube. And you'll see that as I as I drag forward, I can I can basically do more and more towards the camera. And if I drag the top one down further in negative, then I'm revealing things further back there. So depth mat is a very powerful uh, tool to use in post as well and it works on the Z depth information that is built into RPF if you tick the box at render time. So we'll get rid of those two depth mats and what we're going to do now is have just a quick look at some volume fog, some volumetric fog and we're going to take this image, uh, this uh, RPF layer here and we're just going to give it a depth a fog 3D effect. Now, immediately, it, it's it's completely fogged out in white. If I if I change the color to say a bluey color, you might see a little bit more of what we're doing here. Um, the background itself is um, not affected, and uh, remembering that that's the layer that we're working on. So we'll switch back to a white color, and what we're going to do is change our start and end depth position. We're going to wind our, we'll leave our start depth where it is at zero, but we're going to wind the end depth down and you'll see that things become clearer closer to the camera and more affected by the fog back here where the teapot is. So if we, if we try to position it so that the teapot's fairly hazy and or m more hazier than the uh, torus knot here and now we're going to wind the start depth back towards that teapot and if we bring the end depth back up a, up a little bit you'll see that the teapot is is very very heavily affected by the fog but up here uh, where the torus knot is is not so not so heavily affected and now if i turn the white background back on you'll see the effect that, that you get from that. Just give us some uh, real estate here. There we go. Um, and so it gives the impression, and if we, if we bend it out even further, we can have that teapot disappear into that fog and then bring it forward a little bit so that it's, a sh it's shared. That really sells the... Uh, the effect as having a volumetric space, a a, a a a volumetric atmospheric space to work in there, and uh, and that also works with the with the uh, road background. If there was any volumetrics in the road, like if I was to take this now and wind it into something a little more a little more believable, and we'll just bring the end one fog end down a little bit more. That in itself is giving us is giving us something that reads a little bit more believable in the scene being in the uh, in our objects being in that scene just simply because as the uh, fog affects geometry further away from camera it would be more than geometry f closer to camera and that is a natural occurring uh, atmospheric process. So as you can see, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of power to these to these RPF file types and RLA file types work exactly the same. There's only one or two ob uh, there's one or two options that are in an RPF that aren't in an RLA, but um, you certainly get the most powerful um, most powerful features, which is Z depth, and you'll notice here in the project setting that information is actually given to you when you highlight the scene or when you highlight the uh, file that you've brought in th that it has Z depth, material effects, um, object ID and Z coverage so and if I highlight you'll notice the only difference there is this is straight um, matted and this is unmatted, alpha ignored so that's just a, an introduction there are so many more features uh, that, that can be utilized i wanted to keep it fairly short and give you something to go ahead and test and play with
these effects in this 3D channel, um, namely ID, ID identifier, ID mat, fog 3D, extractor, depth of field, depth mat, and 3D channel extract. These only use the information stored within files that have the information, the channel information, and RPF and RLA are those files. So I strongly suggest that now that you've got an RPF file to work with, have a good play with these these uh, features and learn the power, learn what you can do with the added power of having all of that information stored in one file. One thing you need to be aware of is the more channel information that you include in an RPF or an RLA, the bigger the file. So uh, without any extra channel information, the file is generally compar uh, co comparable to a TGA file in size, but it exponentially increases as you start to uh, add more and more channel information because basically you're adding an extra render built into the same file. But as you can see, once the once that's rendered in max and it doesn't the beauty of this system is that it doesn't really take extra time to render in max and the same amount of time it takes to do an rpf it takes to do uh, a, say an rp uh, a tga or a png um, and that's where the real time saver comes is that all of that extra information is in the one file instead of having to render each object individually as you saw that we were able to recolor the teapot but not other objects all of that information is in one file instead of having to be rendered in multiple files and there's a lot more that you can do with these and hopefully we'll come back to RPF and RLAs later on and with a full motion um, animation and we'll have a look at some other valuable um, tools that are incorporated through the use of those channels built into RPF and RLA. So go ahead, have a play, and make sure you utilize the power of the RPF. Until next time, bye for now.